Oh, thank you for the kind introduction. I'm happy to be here today. In this presentation, I'll be sharing the topic I presented at this year's Design Con on dielectric anisotropy. I hope you find it useful. As my friend, Dr. Eric Bogdan likes to say, there are two kinds of engineers, those who have signal integrity problems and those who will. And as a corollary to that, I would like to say, there are two kinds of engineers, those who do not have impedance problems and those who will. Using correct dielectric material properties is crucial for accurate modeling. And one of the most important parameters is EK. So using incorrect EK values can affect the PCB fabrication yield or reduce the performance margins of your design. In the process of designing a PCB stack up, it's important to get accurate dielectric material properties from reliable sources. One of the most important parameters is DK. For a typical differential pair strip line structure, there are generally three different layers of dielectric. There's the core layer, the prepreg layer, and resin layer between the traces, and often all have different DK values. So you'll need to get the right numbers for accurate impedance modeling. And the typical PCB fabrication process is quite a complicated affair. And every step along the way, the cost increases. So by the time you reach step 19 here, electrical tested impedance checking, you wanna make sure that your design is uh, correct. Otherwise, you'll get a call from your fabricator saying your impedance failed. What do you want us to do about it? So what's going on here? So here's what we'll learn today. I'll start off talking about TDR impedance test issues. I'll go into laminate construction and PCB material properties and give an overview of that. I'll explain anisotropy. I'll discuss popular DKDF test methods. And I'll talk about transmission line B impedance and RF antenna implications due to anisotropy. And finally, I'll give an example of dielectric anisotropic valid uh, issues. So some reasons for today's TDR test failures include IPC TM650 2.5.5.57 test method. Uh, that manual is dated. The last update was back in 2004, which is 20 years ago. So back then we were dealing with wider traces, thicker copper, higher DKDF and looser tolerances. Fast forward 20 years, we're now having narrower traces, thinner copper, lower DKDF and tighter tolerances. Back in 2004, typical TDR shown in red, uh, would be typically flat due to the geometries of the day. Uh, today, with the narrow line widths and uh, lower DKDFs, uh, we see a slow monotonic rise, or steeper that it used to be uh, in, uh, compared to 20, 2004. Also, some DKDF test methods affects your impedance uh, calculations. Uh, and those test methods find their way into the DKDF construction tables. And those construction tables are used to do your impedance uh, calculations. So in this example, if we used an in-plane measurement, which I'll be discussing the differences later, and you center your design shown in the red curve with plus minus 10% tolerance. But if, uh, you know, the actual decay we need is out of plane. And when you actually measure it, um, it's actually moved up. The impedance is higher. So you've lost effectively a positive margin on your design by using the uh, wrong decay value. Another issue is um, we do our stack up design. We generally use a 2D field solver. But a 2D field solver is a lossless calculation for impedance. In reality, uh, when we do the TDR measurements, a lossy measurement. 
uh, for the length of the trace. And the actual impedance is near the beginning of the TDR plot. And the effect of the uh, IPC standard, we typically measure 30 to 70 percent along that uh, the TDR line. So if you have a steeper slope, you have more potential of failing. And if you use the wrong BK, uh, it erodes that margin even further, as we see. So before we continue, I'll give an overview of the copper clad laminate manufacturing process, just to bring things into context for the rest of the presentation. So if we start off with the raw materials of uh, the, uh, fiberglass yarns, they're woven into fiberglass cloth, much like they do in the textile industry, using a weaving loom. And they have uh, warp yarns and weft yarns. The warp runs the length uh, of, the, of the cloth, and the weft is the uh, weave pattern in between, going horizontal. Then there's uh, the resin that uh, is used um, with it. And there's many different uh, kinds of resin used today, from epoxy to proprietary blends. Um, the glass fiber cloth that get, then gets impregnated with uh, the resin called the A stage. And it goes through a drying process and the sheets are sheared off in uh, sizable sheets. And you end up with a finished prepray called the B stage. And that's semi-cured uh, prepray. Then there's the copper foil. There's two different types used in the industry. There's rolled copper and electric deposited copper. Now, the rolled copper tends to be smoother uh, and more expensive compared to the ED copper. Uh, then the copper gets, uh, sheets of copper gets put on each side of the pre-break sheets and under heat and pressure, uh, you end up with the finished laminate. Here's some examples of common standard woven glass styles um, from uh, Isola. And you can see there's uh, the weave pattern is different for each uh, style, glass style number. And each number is unique. And they're documented in the IPC 4412A document. And that's a useful document that describes each glass style cloth, uh, the warp and the field dimensions, uh, the weight, and that, many other things. And here's an example of uh, 